Hello everyone, it's a pleasure to be with you today. So today we'll be covering uh, three topics. The first will be a look at distributed ledger technology, how this technology came about, uh, the state of its development, and how we see it maturing over the next few years. Uh, the second uh, subject we'll be covering is a focused review of Ripple, what the, so what the technology is, how we've applied this distributed technology to cross-border payments, and third, we'll look at a liquidity uh, tool that we've been developing over the past several years and we'll be putting into the market, we have put into the market now and we expect to see broader adoption over the coming uh, couple of quarters. So as an overview, Ripple, we are a, a specialist in this distributed ledger technology. Uh, we license this technology to financial institutions. It's a tool that they use to enable real-time cross-border payments. Uh, we, we specifically focus on low value payments, a platform to enable both low value and high value payments. Uh, we recognize that low value payment is a, an unmet market need, uh, a demand that has been growing over the past several years, but we still don't have a solution in place today. Our current infrastructure doesn't support it. So we focused on building this solution that enables both the low and the high value payments. So we'll move into so when we think about payment systems today that we've had in the past they're generally centralized systems these are systems where there's one central operator in the middle and that central operator seen here on the slide as, as the red entity in the middle of the circle that central operator will hold and manage the ledger it keeps track of all the accounts of the participants in that network, um, who's paying who, uh, and is the, the central authority for the, uh, the payments that flow through that network. Now, several years ago, uh, we saw the development of uh, a technology breakthrough of distributed systems. This is distributed technology where the network operates without a central entity. So there's no central operator here, meaning there's no central point of failure We've removed that central point of failure, enabling greater resiliency of the network. So one entity could perhaps go offline, may have a system error, but the other, other participants in the network can continue making payments. So what we saw in this, this technology breakthrough uh, is, a, is a technology that can be used for many different use cases. We've, we've, looked, at, um, we've looked at several different uh, use cases that have come to market. And so we've got several different technologies that have come to market that are distributed in nature. And now we're, we're progressing the, the maturity of that technology for different use cases. So since this technology has been, um, been launched, there's a, a, a lot of interest in distributed ledger and blockchain uh, from many different sectors. Um, here's a quote I have from Santander, the large uh, Spanish bank. Um, in their studies with this technology, they see the potential to save 15 to $20 billion a year by 2022 when a, this technology is applied to cross-border payments, securities, and compliance. So a huge potential for, for cost savings that can come from adopting this technology. There's also a potential for new revenue. Um, here, a uh, consulting firm McKinsey has um, forecasted that when distributed ledger technology is applied for personal remittances, uh, there's a potential to add three to five billion US dollars in new revenue for financial institutions. So FIs can benefit both from great cost savings and new revenue. They expect to see this technology uh, at scale by 2021. Um, Ripple is, is in the market now growing this network. We expect to see us at scale um, probably before 2021, but that does seem like a reasonable time frame to us. So we, we have a technology breakthrough and we see lots of potential that asks that, that begs the question, where is this technology in development? How mature is it? What I see happening in the market right now is a, a typical innovation cycle, a cycle we've seen in several other technologies. 
It first starts with the technology breakthrough. Well, there's one design that we see potential with for many use cases. And I'll use the car analogy here. The, the Ford Model T was one of the first automobiles. This was the technology breakthrough. But it's and we saw lots of potential for many different use cases. However, we were restricted by only having one model. We had one design that we would have to force on many different use cases. Very quickly, we realized we need to specialize the design of the solution for the use case. So fast forward to today, when we have a maturity in the technology, we have designs specific to each use case. So we have a, an 18 wheeler that can move goods, a van to move a fan. So we have a technology breakthrough this blockchain distributed ledger, and it's now in a state of specialization where, it's, where the solutions are focusing on very specific use cases. Three of those use cases is that I see as the most mature are cross-border payments, securities reconciliation, and trade finance. Now, important to note, these are very different use cases. They're very different business lines. They have different core problems. Uh, we're solving for different challenges. So the solutions will likely differ we, th we think will differ greatly. Um, they're both specialized for each of those use cases. Is there a question on the line? Nope, Hear hearing none, um, feel free to, to type a question in into the chat box and we'll be happy to get to it. Uh, I'll proceed for now though. So Ripple is an example of a company that's taken a blockchain and distributed ledger and applied it specifically to cross-border payments. So we're focused on just one of those use cases, making sure that our technology and solution meets the specific challenges of that uh, business line. So as a company, we're 160 employees. We're based across several cities listed at the bottom of the screen there. Uh, San Francisco is our home base. We have offices in New York, London, Sydney, Luxembourg, and Tokyo. Uh, most of our employees are engineers, two thirds, two thirds of the 160 are engineers. We see this technology coming to, uh, coming to the forefront, um, being based on three different domains. And we've, we've recruited from those three domains shown on the slides here. First is financial services. This is expertise coming from financial institutions that understand the product and the demand. So we have listed here some of the banks and, and payment companies that our employees have come from. The second domain is technology, having the software engineers that understand how to build these types of solutions. And finally, it's regulation, so having an expertise of the regulatory frameworks that would fit these types of technologies. It's the convergence of those three domains, the convergence and balance of those domains, we think is crucial to creating uh, or seeing this technology um, used within the financial uh, services industry. So what we, I'll, I'll cover now what we're seeing in the market. Right now, we're, we're seeing this increasing demand for low value cross-border payments. It's coming from three sectors. First is remittances, your typical person-to-person -person payment overseas. This isn't a new demand, but given how global we've become as a, as a global economy, uh, we see an increased demand for remittance services. Second is small businesses seeking international growth. These are small companies seeking to import raw materials or to export their goods elsewhere. Today, they're typically bound by the fact that cross-border payments are a slow, cumbersome process. Uh, they, the business may not have the expertise or the resources to enable cross-border payments. So they typically just stay domestic. There's demand by banks and small businesses to enable small, uh, small companies to grow overseas. Finally, the, the newest aspect of demand from cross-border payments is digital platform-based businesses. This is a new type of company that's in the market that has a very different payment demand than what we've seen uh, traditionally from large corporates. Uh, examples of these businesses are, are companies like Alibaba, uh, Amazon, Uber, uh, Airbnb. These are, these are online companies that are platforms that have global reach. Their payment need is, is all cross-border, or predominantly cross-border, uh, at a very high volume, but low value. So Uber paying its, its drivers in, in India and Philippines 
and, and drivers all around the world. Um, that payment demand, these, these are very small payments. They're not large invoice payments for millions of dollars. They're, they're small individual payments to individuals. That's a different payment demand than what we see from corporates. Corporates typically send large individual batched payments overseas. Whereas what we're seeing with these digital platform-based businesses, these very high growth uh, companies, are, are the opposite payment demand. It's low value and a very high volume. Uh, traditional payment rails don't really support this. So there's this unmet demand in the market, particularly from now from large corporates. When we're looking at our payment systems today, the, when making cross-border payments, we use a sequential process, meaning there's a, a chain of intermediaries and the payment moves one step in the chain at a time. So one link at a time. On the slide here, you can see there's, there's three steps to that payment. Uh, the originating bank will send the payment to a correspondent. The correspondent will receive messaging, turn inward, make debits and credits to its books, uh, book the payment, and then send a message to the receiving correspondent, step two. Uh, the receiving correspondent recent, uh, receives messaging, books that transaction internally, and then sends step three to the final beneficiary bank. So it's one link in this chain at a time. This sequential process is what creates the pain points in cross-border payments. So it creates uncertainty. The originating bank doesn't have visibility into the status of the payment once it's, once it's been sent. Um, there's delays. This relay process uh, creates three and four, sometimes five days delays for final settlement. Uh, there's a risk in not having transparency of where the payment is. The originating and beneficiary bank don't know uh, the, their, uh, their counterparty risk. They don't know where the payment is from a traceability perspective. Um, if something goes wrong, it takes uh, there's a long reconciliation process to determine where the payment is, where the error occurred, and how to resolve that. It's a rather cumbersome uh, approach. And then finally, there's unknown cost. Because of this sequential process, uh, the originating bank doesn't know the fees that the corresponding and, and beneficiary banks will apply to the payment, nor do they know the FX cost before they initiate that payment. So the originating bank sends the payment without visibility into its status or the total cost. This creates a, a, a major problem for cross-border payments in that the sender doesn't know how much money will be received, uh, nor does it know when the payment will be received. So if you're trying to, say, pay a bill or an invoice, uh, it's, it's difficult to impossible uh, to know your fees up front and to know how much money will be deposited. That's a, that's a large pain point we see in the market today. Ripple is looking to optimize this process uh, resolve these pain points uh, by changing the process of the payment, moving from a, a sequential process to a coordinated process, where the transaction happens in one step, it's executed across all the links in the chain simultaneously. So we synchronize the payment instead of going one step at a time. What this enables, is first is speed. Uh, Ripple reduces settlement times from around five days uh, to about five seconds. Uh, we enable full transparency of where the payment is in the process. Uh, and we have certainty of total cost. The originator will know the total cost of the payment upfront before he originates the payment. So this allows the originator to say exactly how much money should be deposited at the beneficiary bank because it knows what all the cost will be along the way. It's this transparency and certainty that Ripple enables that's a, a core competency of the, of the solution. Um, so this kind of begs the question about how does Ripple do this? How do we move from sequential to uh, coordinated synchronized payments? So Ripple is a software solution that we license to financial institutions. There's two parts to it. The first is a messaging platform. Uh, today for messaging, banks are using file-based systems. That's a one-way message. The bank will send a file to the, uh, the beneficiary bank. So it's a, a one-way conversation, very similar to writing a paper letter and putting it in the post office. They drop it in the post and they hope the postman delivers it. They don't have visibility into 
where it is in the, in the delivery process, or if it's been received, if the recipient is responding, doesn't have visibility into those things. Ripple is a, is a, a generational upgrade. Uh, we provide a bi-directional messaging platform. That means it's a two-way conversation between banks with real-time tracking embedded in the solution. So you can see where the message is in transmission. You can see that it's been received. If the, uh, if the recipient bank is now responding to you, you have that complete visibility. So it's kind of like going from a paper letter to texting someone on WeChat uh, or, or iMessage. You have full visibility and control of where it is, where that message is in transmission. So we're using ISO 2022 format, uh, what's becoming an international messaging format. Um, we have um, some extensible fields for that enable the tracking. Um, we, we chose this format, given it is international in scope, there's, there's growing adoption of 20, 2022. Um, and many banks today are already sending 2022 messages uh, via Swift or, or their existing platforms. So it's an easy integration. Um, although we do note, not all banks are using 2022. There are some banks that use a proprietary standard or a different standard. There are translation services that Ripple can provide that will take their existing messaging format and translate it into 2022 so they can enable a Ripple payment. So the messaging is the first part of our solution. The second is settlement. We coordinate real-time settlement between it's cross-currency or cross-network. This is a, a, a distinguishing factor of Ripple from what you'd see with other uh, traditional payment services like Swift or other uh, providers. When we think about a cross-border payment today, all that's provided is that messaging. The message is sent and received by the bank, and then the bank turns inward to do its own processing of the payment. They do their own debit and credit tra uh, transactions internally. It's not standardized. Each bank has their own, own process. Ripple brings together both the messaging and this settlement capability tightly bound together. We're enabling the messaging and we're coordinating that movement of funds on the bank's books. Um, that's crucial to driving a lot of the efficiency that, that Ripple enables. Now, to do this, to enable this settlement, to coordinate these transactions between banks, we've developed a new technology called Interledger. This is an open source technology that are, it's a set of instructions that tells banks when to debit and credit particular accounts. So this technology is what allows the banks to synchronize the payment across the different institutions. Um, we've, we've developed the technology, we've gifted it to the W3C. It's the uh, global standards body for the World Wide Web. They manage many open standards today like WWW, uh, when you type in a, a, a website, uh, or HTTP, um, their, their, their expertise is in managing these open protocols. Um, so we've gifted Interledger to the W3C. It's seen adoption now in several other platforms, aside from Ripple, um, that, platforms that are looking to enable interoperability um, between two, two ledgers or two institutions. So we're using Ledger, Interledger as this uh, set of instructions of when to debit and credit accounts. I'll give a, uh, I'm gonna take a minute to give a sample payment on Ripple. So you can see how the transactions will flow between these institutions. In this example, we have a US bank on the left uh, and a Malaysian bank on the right. Um, the, the, two in, the two banks will use a software called Ripple Connect. It's software that we, we license to the banks. This software is what has the messaging um, and that settlement capability built into it. In this example, we'll have a sender in the US. You see a sender's account at the US bank is paying a receiver in Malaysia. That receiver has an account at the Malaysian bank. Also at the banks, there's a hold account. Think this as something of similar to an escrow service where it's a, an account that funds will be put in to guarantee good funds for making the payment. And finally, there are liquidity accounts. Each bank will hold a, a liquidity account on its books um, that has the local currency pre-funded in it. So in this example, you have a USD account at the US bank and a ringgit account at the Malaysian bank. So step one in this payment 
is the same process uh, of messaging that you would see in other institutions or other platforms. You have a prepayment message. So Ripple, with that bi-directional messaging platform, that two-way conversation between banks, will exchange sender and receiver information. Uh, banks will use that to enable their compliance requirements. And this messaging also determines the fees and the FX cost. So before the payment's initiated, we're exchanging all of the um, this upfront information and we're determining that cost. It's through this process that the originating bank can tell the originator the exact amount of the fund of the fees and the funds that will be delivered at the for the receiver. Now all this exchange of information happens directly between the banks. Uh, it doesn't come to Ripple. Uh, we don't we as a company don't see or store that information. It's all maintained privately by the two banks and their own databases. So we've designed it that way to enable strong data privacy. So the information about a bank's customer is not coming to a technology company or a company or a server in a different country. It's all maintained by the banks. So after we use uh, the messaging, after the receiving bank confirms that the receiver is an account in good standing, it meets all of its co uh, compliance requirements, they're happy to receive the bank or after you receive the payment, we'll move to step two. Step two is the actual funds flow. Using Interledger, that set of instructions, um, two, two debits occur. At the US bank, imagine this payment is for $100. We'll move $100 from the sender's account to the hold account. At the same time, at the Malaysian bank, we'll move a corresponding amount uh, of currency from the liquidity account to the hold account. Step two in this process involves a piece of software called a validator. Now this validator, it's software part of the solution that we license to banks. Um, what will happen when there's enough funds in that hold account at the US bank that Ripple Connect will send a message to the validator to say we have, a, we have fully funded the amount of, of uh, currency for this payment, full $100. We'll send a message to that validator confirming that. And at the Malaysian bank, the Malaysian bank will send a message to the validator as well, saying we have a, a good funds set aside to cover the full amount of that payment. Once the validator receives both confirmations, it will send an approval message back to both banks. It's this approval message that tells the banks to release the funds to the recipient. Once they receive those messages, those funds are released, they go into the recipient's accounts. So all the funds here in this example are already on the bank's books through their existing customers. So Ripple's coordinating a debit and credit internally at each of the banks um, at the same time. This process may seem like many steps, uh, many parts to it. Um, when it's put into practice, typically takes about five seconds, about all of this negotiation and messaging. So it's, it's very quick compared to, say, today, a four or five day settlement period. There's a, a, I'll take a minute to talk about some of the risk and compliance implications of using the technology. So when we think about distributed ledger, we've applied it in a way that financial institutions are using it. So the, the financial institution maintains that customer relationship. Its requirements for KYC, customer onboarding, AML, uh, payment reporting to its potential regulator are all unchanged. Those continue to be performed by the financial institution. Uh, Ripple is not part of that process, and nor do we change their obligations there. There are several things that we do improve. Um, we enable transaction visibility in real time across the leg of the payment. Um, we enable fee pre-disclosure. We've talked about the bank will know the total fee before they initiate the payment. There are several countries right now that are requiring banks uh, to show the customer the exact fee before they initiate that payment. Ripple's technology enables the bank to do that. Forced payment status. I have real-time confirmation of the receipt that they can share with the uh, originator of the payment. And then five is the technology software vendor. Ripple's licensing this technology to banks. Uh, so we're typically treated as a software a supplier uh, subject to that bank's vendor management program um, or, or their IT change management program. So we're a new vendor to these financial institutions. So there's a couple key benefits. Ripple's enabling global reach. We're enabling a cross-border rail 
that is low and high value payments. So the low value payments is a, a new capability that we've put to the market. These payments are on demand and in real time. So we're moving from settlement down to, to seconds. And there's complete visibility into the payment, whereas today the originating bank doesn't have visibility for three to four days. So this we see as a generational upgrade in the cross-border infrastructure that financial institutions have available to them. Everything we've talked about thus far is software. Uh, is technology that a bank would put in place. But for any payment system, there's a layer above technology that's essential to have uh, for banks. That's the governance layer. Um, most governance or all governance frameworks today assume a central operator. Like we have in a centralized systems as an entity in the middle that we can uh, apply these frameworks to. We knew with Ripple being a distributed network without a central operator, we'd have to design these frameworks from scratch. So we assembled an advisory board of six leading financial institutions from around the world to help us develop the commercial framework, uh, a, rule, a rule set, and technical standards. So this group, this group of, uh, of frameworks define crucial things for payments, settlement finality, uh, dispute resolution, um, the technical standards for the messaging fields, how to interpret what's in those fields, ensuring all the financial institutions are interpreting those the same way. Altogether, this body of work provides certainty for financial institutions that are making payments to each other. There's a governance and legal framework in place um, uh, to reference when making those payments. This is a key uh, distinguishing factor for Ripple. As we look at most distributed ledger platforms today, they're purely technology. They're still in that development phase. Um, a, a, an easy litmus test to see if a distributed ledger platform is moving towards production is to see if they've solved for governance. Most have not. This is a legal expertise. It's not software in nature. It's not technical, technical in nature, but it's, it's a governance layer. That's a crucial part for any of these systems to go live. Um, we've, we've, we've solved that in Ripple. We've been working on it for about 18 months. Um, this provides that certainty that's needed. So altogether, we have, uh, here's a snapshot of our customers. Um, we have 15 of the largest 50 banks uh, that are, are using Ripple. Uh, we have contracts with another 75 institutions in 16 countries uh, to integrate Ripple this and next year. We have a, a large pipeline of banks coming onto the network. We also have a consortium of 15 Japanese banks. Uh, they're come together to build both a uh, cross-border rail and a domestic disbursement solution. So that's what we're doing today. It's a software solution enabling real-time cross-border payments. As our network, or today on the network, we're using very liquid currencies, US dollars to euros, uh, euros to Canadian dollars, yen to, to US dollars. These are very liquid currencies. So liquidity is not a challenge. But as our network grows to new financial institutions, new countries, um, uh, new areas, we'll likely see currency pairs that are not liquid. They don't have a strong liquidity uh, base between them, but it's not a market maker to provide that liquidity between the financial institutions. So we know we'll need some type of liquidity solution to help liquidity scale at a very high rate. I want to talk for a minute about uh, a digital asset um, that we're, we're using to enable liquidity to scale. Now, today, we enable payment reach through account relationships. These are pre-funded accounts that banks will have with each other to, to provide liquidity. A bank would open a Nostro account with its correspondent or pre-fund account with another institution. There's several costs to doing this. There's a fee to open and maintain the account that the bank will pay to its correspondent. Um, there's, there's compliance cost that the bank will, will incur to keep the account open. There's a large opportunity cost of pre-funding and trapping liquidity in those accounts. So banks will often uh, over allocate funds to the account because they're not sure what their payment volume will be. So there's a large opportunity cost to having that, that capital trapped there. Altogether, these costs make these account relationships only viable for very high volume currencies. 
like on the slide here, I have US dollars, euros, and Canadian dollars. You have the banks will have enough payment volume to justify pre-funding these accounts. That's not the case for a liquid or low volume corridors. So for instance, all the currencies on the bottom portion of the slide. So the Philippines uh, peso and the Canadian dollar likely don't have enough volume to justify opening and pre-funding an account there. So we know that's a limit that exists today in the traditional networks, but will also exist on Ripple. But we're thinking through how do we solve that. We've taken um, a, a digital asset, or often referred to as a virtual currency, called XRP. XRP we use as a liquidity tool between banks to enable immediate reach for liquidity between institutions. So today, if a Canadian bank wanted to pre-fund an account at a Philippines bank, it would have to send a, a payment through a traditional rail. It would take four or five days to get there. And if they needed to withdraw that fund, it would take another four to five days to get back. So that's a, that's a pain point in enabling fast payments. With XRP, this is a tool that the Canadian bank would use to immediately send value to the Philippines bank. In exchange, the Philippines bank would earmark local currency, a uh, peso, on its books, and then make a fiat to fiat payment with the currency they've just secured. So it may be a fiat to fiat payment between Canadian dollars and peso. They've used XRP up front to enable direct liquidity between those. So instead of having to pre-fund accounts with banks all around the world, a bank can hold one position in its domestic account and send XRP directly to the bank it needs to make a payment to for the exact amount of currency that needs to be dispersed. This gives you uh, the ability to, to consolidate all of your capital positions, have a much more capital efficiency, and have reach directly to institutions when you need it. You don't have to pre-fund and park capital at banks that is not being used. So put to use this way, XRP allows fiat currencies to move much more efficiently. A bank can pre-fund an account and get liquidity immediately on demand. This is all designed to make fiat currency move more, uh, more efficiently and more fluidly. So it complements a fiat currency. The payments being made are still in fiat currency, still Canadian dollars to Philippine peso. Uh, however, they're using XRP just as a tool to source that liquidity. So XRP in this lens, it complements fiat currency. When we think about other virtual currencies, say Bitcoin, for instance, that's a tool that's being used to replace fiat currency. So the consumer would take this currency and use it to buy its coffee with instead of using the central bank's currency. So that, that approach becomes inherently competitive with the central bank's own currency. With XRP, we've taken that similar technology and applied it in a way that complements fiat currency, help bank, helps banks source currency immediately. So this is like a second generation of the or second use case that's come to the market for virtual currency. We ran a, a trial last year of 12 banks that did not have accounts with each other, but wanted to make cross-border payments where they used XRP as a means to source fiat currency. So they were using XRP to source liquidity and test its use case. In that trial, we found that it was quite successful in getting immediate access to liquidity and having significant capital savings for these institutions. We're moving now to, um, to production of this type of solution. Uh, we're partnering with several exchanges in different countries to list XRP, to quote it between the local currency. So there's a, there's a healthy liquidity ecosystem of many exchanges providing uh, liquidity into and out of XRP, allowing or enabling a source for banks to turn to, 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 to source XRP and enable it for uh, cross-border liquidity. So we see this as our network expands becoming a crucial part in scaling liquidity. We should note all the payments remain in fiat currency, so it's still government currency, and this is an optional tool. We don't require it for use of the network. The bank can use Ripple without ever uh, engaging with XRP if, that's, if they don't have an interest in that. So it's a preview of how we're looking at solving liquidity in our system. Uh, it's an optional tool um, that we do expect to see a great adoption for over the coming years. 
So that concludes the presentation today. We have about 15 minutes if there are specific questions. I see we do have some that I will address first. Uh, give me one second while we take a look at these questions. Mm -hmm. So the first question is around data privacy. For the transactions made on Ripple, um, are, does everyone on the network see that transaction or is it only the banks with that word within the payment? We've designed Ripple specifically to only enable the banks within that payment to see that payment details. So if it's a bank, bank A paying bank B, only bank A and bank B can see that payment. Other banks on the network, say bank C and bank D, do not have visibility into it. So a key part of Ripple is that there's not one ledger in the middle of our system that everyone shares. Each bank has its own ledger. And we connect and synchronize payments across banks' own ledgers directly. So this enables very strong data privacy. Only banks within that payment have access to that payment information. This enables, uh, or, or in many ways, in many countries, banks are prohibited from sharing payment information with banks that are not in the payment chain. So this design of having many ledgers within Ripple, each bank having its own ledger, helps facilitate compliance with those data privacy rules. I, that, that's a, an example of how the technology, distributed ledger technology has matured. Early models of distributed ledger had one ledger in the middle that everyone on the platform would share. Ripple has progressed from that design to each bank has its own ledger. So in this, in this transition, um, a question here is about does Ripple use blockchain technology or not? Um, we're certainly, we've, we've taken uh, the technology breakthrough of blockchain and distributed ledger and specialized it for cross-border payment use case. So this, this transition from having one ledger in the middle to having many ledgers that synchronize with each other, that's one example of how the technology has matured uh, from the technology breakthrough to the cross-border use case. There are other use cases that may make more sense to have one central ledger, like securities reconciliation. And that use case the pain point today is that you want to be able, you, you're not able to see what other participants hold. It's hard to reconcile transactions. A good solution for that is having one ledger in the middle that everyone can, can see and share. In securities transactions, securities reconciliation, you don't have the same data privacy uh, requirements. So it's easy to have one ledger. But in cross-border payments, we knew we had to mature the solution to enable stronger data privacy. So it's not one ledger, but there's multiple ledgers um, all using encryption and cryptography that were technology breakthroughs from blockchain. So we use several aspects of blockchain and, and um, blockchain and distributed ledger, but we don't have that central ledger. So the question is about what, what use cases we specialized in. Um, we're, we're because uh, the different use cases are very specialized, payments, securities, trade finance, those are very different core problems. We, we do believe that the solutions will be specific to each of those business lines. It won't be one design for all of those use cases. So we've chosen to specialize in cross-border payments and have focused primarily on cross-border. Now, when we think about those other tr transactions, securities trades or trade finance, half of those transactions are a payment. So we chose cross-border payments as payments we see as the foundation, a foundational platform for many financial services transactions. So we're, what we're building is a technology platform for payments that we would layer other solutions on top of, like securities or trade finance. We're first starting with cross-border payments. Uh, there's a question about the stage of, of maturity of the solution. Um, we've completed 30 proof of concepts and pilots over the past two years. Uh, we've, at this point, we finalized the product and the design, and it's now in production mode. So we're integrating with several of those financial institutions we saw on the slide earlier, so about 75 contracts uh, in place. We're in state of integrating the solution, or it's already been integrated with banks. So banks are, we have several banks live on the platform today, and many others 
coming to adopt it as well. So we've moved far beyond proof of concepts and pilots. We are in production mode within in nine countries now. We're adding another 16 countries this year, um, but it's full production uh, ready to go. So there's a question on how do we deal with um, disputes or claims for redemption where there's a, a difference in opinion on what happened with the payment. So we talked about the governance framework uh, on, a, on a previous slide, but this advisory board we pulled together to enable or to design commercial frameworks, rules, and standards. Within that body of work, then that network agreement, we define the dispute resolution process that all the banks on the network agree to. So we have certainty around if there's a dispute after a payment has been settled, these are the processes we take to resolve that dispute or resolve instances of fraud. So we've incorporated that into the network agreement, much like you'd see on a traditional payment system. So there's a great question here. Is there a validator node that, could, that monitors all transactions on the network? We saw on that previous slide about the validator would uh, confirm that the good funds are available and send the confirmation back to the banks. Uh, each bank will have its own validator. This gives each pair of banks control over the validator they pick on the network. There's not one validator on Ripple, but many validators. So bank A and bank B might choose to have one validator, but bank C and bank D will have a different validator. So this gives, uh, this, what this does is provides uh, there's not one single point of failure. There's not one single validator, but many validators. So that if, if something does happen to one validator, other banks using different validators can continue to, to make transactions. This adds operational resiliency to the solution by having multiple types of validators. And finally, our last question is around XRP. Um, so looking for some more detail on, on XRP. XRP, there's 100 billion XRP. It was, they were created when the system launched. Uh, the company owns um, about 20 billion XRP that we have today that we can disperse. We, we can sell to financial institutions or market makers. We have another 50 billion uh, locked up in lockup, meaning that no one can touch those XRP right now. And by locking those up, that gives certainty to the market about the supply of XRP. Um, incrementally, over several years, the XRP in that lockup will be released. So there's a release schedule on our, on our website that talks about um, how the lockup works and gives certainty to the market about the total supply of XRP. And the other 30 billion of XRP have already been dispersed. So they're in the market today. Uh, a, for a bank to use XRP for payments, they'll typically turn to a local exchange that has listed XRP. So these are exchanges in the market today, uh, some new exchanges and some traditional FX platforms that banks already turned to to source FX liquidity. So those entities are listing XRP with the, with the local currency. So the bank will turn to that exchange, um, purchase the XRP immediately and send to the beneficiary. So in most cases, they're not holding XRP, but they're purchasing, purchasing it at that exchange in the local country. A bank can opt to buy XRP directly and hold it on its own account if they would like to do that. Um, but we also have the, the option of going to a local exchange. Now, the local exchanges is a crucial part of that liquidity ecosystem. We need to have many local exchanges in many countries to provide lots of liquidity. Uh, we, at the beginning of this year, uh, we hired um, one of the leaders of commodities trading from CME Group in the US, one of the largest commodities exchange houses. Um, he is now running our XRP liquidity partnerships. So he's working with enterprise grade exchanges to list XRP and to provide liquidity into that local currency. And just last, just this week actually, we listed I believe it was six or seven new exchanges in, in a variety of countries that have listed XRP, all part of this approach to build a healthy liquidity ecosystem. Our website uh, has, has all that listed uh, in, in a new XRP section you can look, you can read through. 
that's all the questions we have in the chat window. Uh, if there's other questions, feel free to add them there. Um, we'll pause here for a minute. Also, for any uh, questions over the line, you can unmute and ask a question if you'd like. We're not seeing any other questions. Uh, on the slide here is my contact email. I'm happy to take any follow-up questions that you may have. Uh, feel free to email them to me uh, or through CSEN, and they'll get them to me directly. So thank everyone for, for coming out today. We appreciate you dialing in. Um, you'll have access to the slides afterwards, and you can look at our website, ripple.com, for, for more documents. There's a section called Collateral that has both product overview and technical uh, documents for the solution. So thank you for your time today. Do you feel the